everyone. Today's talk will be titled How to Handle the Monsters with It. Handling the Monsters with It. And what Mr. Within is here to simply communicate about is in actuality an aspect of man's mind which many people don't want to confront. So if there's any sense of discomfort you're feeling, not intuitively, but if you're feeling there's some form of discomfort that you shouldn't be hearing this talk, perhaps you, should, you don't need to. But again, I will continue. The talk is suggested to communicate about how to handle the monsters within. And this is not suggesting that you are within yourself a monster, but it's simply suggesting that because man has the ability to perceive a monster outside, he can wonder about that existence within himself. And so realities and many simulations of thought are, uh, uh, work, uh, are affecting how real things are for us in every moment. There is a very huge complexity when a being in a cosmos this vast chooses to be individual. So we need to realize that perhaps we have been counting man as a lower civilization, but existentially, just the nature of this human form, the way it's sprouting out of manifestation, is one where it is, very, it is a very advanced individuation. Where if a galaxy wanted to know how its cells look like, for example, you know, if it was a human, you know, it, it see us standing right here. <laughs> we are the smallest emissaries of the cosmos, it seems. <laughs> and there's a very powerful thing because all manifestation is the intermediary. Everything that exists within your moment is a prophet communicating to you the, the movement of your truth and how conception is kept for you. We must realize that we cannot ignore two things. That man has developed spiritual imagery in his culture and man has also developed very mechanical and technological imagery in his culture. And these two things are moving. They're just movements just started. It's as if like we, we're not caring about uh, who, where our culture came from. Do you know, because when you become aware of the origin of thought, there is a renaissance behind it. There is a renaissance behind that person's quote and that person's words. Every lifetime is like a renaissance. And if you become aware of manifestation, space and time will work with you differently. When space and time shift, whatever concept of a monster you've had, whatever concept of some negative entity or whatever you've had begins to shift because the knower within you is recognizing that what is put in front of it is not only it. What that means is that your awareness to what you are is your momentum to the most greatest peak of your expression. Right now, you don't need to think about what you physically need to do much. You need to see how you're internally receiving your externality, what physicality means for you. As you observe this, you get into a sense of self-awareness that you are not bound by chains that sometimes you uh, were not even aware of that were given to you. And this is the conditioning of you. This is how you are brought up into being an individual form and this individual form is beginning to look at its collective. It's like every, every failure is telling it, you think you're this? No, you're not. You know, and constantly life is taking us through this cycle as temporal forms. So what that means is when you think about what to do with information, if you have a belief, if you have an idea, that idea is as temporal as you are. Because the audience is temporal. When the audience physically is temporal, then physicality is not the immediate reality. And that's why you see many poets are saying that there's, there's this gathering, but we're not getting there. As if there's the state of consciousness that is our salvation. And so, regardless what we want to call it, an act of deep self-contemplation through silence and stillness and an awareness to the oceans of your breath, will begin to suggest that you knew yourself beyond definition, so stop acting like you don't. Stop acting as if you're not aware of the experiencer because uh, Mr. Within, before he found Mr. Within, there was an actor. It was an act with huge significance. There was such an act going on. There was such a, a constant belief that I was something in something that it was as if for a second I was blinded by my arrogance to assume that this is my house. Do you see? And so the monsters within you 
are areas of your being which are shaking your clarity, which is always there permeating. But the clarity is so able to be clear that it can manifest anything that could think it's not clear. Do you recognize? So I am talking about the nature of reality and how monsters shift with the world. So if you think there's a monster within you, there is of course an idea with an image there that doesn't need to be there. And so we need to be aware of the substance of our thoughts by how the being is acting in the present moment. Your greatest understandings of yourself come in the present moment because the present moment might be needing a different version of you than the one you're constantly keeping in your mind. It is up to you to choose if collective consciousness needs to dissolve all fear and be understood or fear still needs to affect your life in you thinking that there's something that can destroy you. Death is a concept that should mindfully be studied and what that means is that you must be in silence. Because sometimes when you're around others, you feel that the you that is there is a different you. Silence is the gift of an individual being to himself. Solitude is a gift of an individual being to himself to recognize himself. If you begin to see, there have been some moments in my life where I've been uh, living in a certain way especially when I was younger and I was developing something and something was being built and I was like, all right, I'm moving towards some kind of, you know, uh, very abundant life. And at the same time, something in life happened, very irrelevant, just as if, as if one day I woke up and I could no longer do those tasks. Just physically, I could not. And so I noticed that it was as if life telling me, uh, this is not your path, but you have gained enough experience from this projection, now move on to the next one. We are not always meant to be in the same story that we are born out of. Rebirth is the emptiness being reintroduced. The ideology of monsters is a development that is an aspect of your conditioning based on how you have been interpreting experiences based on your language, terminology and ideology which has come from a cultural phenomena. It's just something that happened. Do you know? So it is up to man to choose where he puts his structure of thought. What that means is before I know anything, I don't know. And I'm just walking and I don't even have the distinction of should I know something or not knowing. I'm just an experience. And then if I choose to come into thought form, if I choose to bring manifestation and then you see like, oh gosh, I've, I've lived for example uh, 23 years. And you see that, what does this life do? This life has been information for you. Your conditioning is just the information you have to work with because this information is keeping your idea alive. That's why a past is relevant. That's why people have photo albums. That's why a diary could feel like a time machine. Because human experience, regardless of its sophistication of how it looks and how it's masked, is always aware that it is transcendent. It is beyond its knowing because it simply doesn't know. So what that means is uh, forget logic, you know, and let us see that the practical aspect that will really, it, it, it's an efficient consciousness technology for man is in immediate and instant self-awareness to all causality before interpretation. Before interpretation, that means no more questions, no more answers, no one's giving questions, no one's giving answers. We're just all silently walking into the forest of life. We're beginning to see that that bird on the branch did not need to go to a, a, <laughs> a flying school or something. It just knew it, innately the ability came. Man is thinking that we have so many branches of knowledge. Nobody knows the roots of knowledge which are innately found within the field of existence. And so if unified field means anything for you, you need to wonder how much the word unity means to you before you use that word. I find it ignorant for people, uh, think of it this way, how ignorant would it be if a very uh, religious person but without an education comes to a scientist and starts telling him, hey, your theory is wrong. 
So similarly, how ignorant would it be if a scientist goes to a person who ha and the scientist has not lived the same life experiences as that being and says, your experience of God is rubbish. You know, your God, there's no God. You begin to see it's the psychology of man. These are games of the mind. And if there was ever peace, it would be in the silence of such intense uh, influence from a past that could not take steps mindfully. We must start uh, very clearly and we must look around ourselves. We are right now thrown into unknown lands, which is our moment of experience as an existential point of attention. And now that we are here, we are beginning to see we have so many interpretations. And so we have interpretations of monsters, oh God, all those things that were first hiding in my bed, then they went into alleys, then they went into the worst wars, and well, gosh, 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 gosh. Reality and the story of man sometimes are mixed up. And if you think you are still a character, ask yourself, who within you has known enough to say that you are only this? And rationality and irrationality, just like two concepts on your shoulders, will leave. You will begin seeing the wisdom in the sacred hymns um, and very, very ecstatic love poems of, for example, Rumi, where he says, beyond, out beyond ideas of right doing and wrong doing, there is a place. I'll meet you there. Simply suggesting how the human experience can, in a sense, in one moment, become so existentially aware that the framework of duality and projecting a certain shape of man constantly is gone. What that means is that perhaps the clarity and the emptiness and the mindfulness in Zen was the beauty of the prayer that was being done without thought to a God which was the omniscience that was always now. And so when you existentially become sensitive, you're not just looking for theories and you're not just collecting books. You're realizing that human experience is cosmic life intelligence. What is this life force? <laughs> You know? It's like if Yoda had the force, why did he need to have a cane? You know, why? Why we need to be observant of these questions. You know? <laughs> of course I'm being very clear for here. Mankind needs to perceive that the world around him is empty because his certainty is shifting in the form that he considers. And very simply said, you're different from your five-year-old self. You've grown up. You know, literally every year you're living, it's not just the same you. It is you going more within the experiences of life and understanding things. Even that person playing a video game, he might not be ex directly experiencing an understanding of life, but he's definitely understanding an experience of a simulation. And so that's very important because man's uh, inner eyes are opening to the ability of a multidimensional being to be omnipresent, to be simultaneously present, but it's very important because right now we need to have a new renaissance of ideas. What that means is uh, what Mr. Within sees is that he's been simply just writing his own stuff, random stuff, and suddenly he's seeing all the stuff he's been written is moving to a new renaissance of movement which others have to contribute. So what that means is uh, uh, I feel I've gotten to the party early and everybody else needs to come to this party. And what this party is, it is not a party to ideology. It is a party into an existential awareness which activates your ability, not based on you wanting to get something as a thing, but through a comfort that you are, you begin to see that manifestation can occur gracefully and you can begin uh, accessing your greater vision. So what that means is stop thinking that suddenly someone's gonna, you know, uh, put his thumb on your forehead and suddenly you, you're going to become the most enlightened being. And so that may be so in certain, for certain beings, but for, for man right now, and the Western man, and I want to say the student perhaps, let's, uh, let's say this modern student, right? The modern student of life. So let's say this student, uh, it's up to him to recognize and it's the task of every being to take any inspiration they have from their memory and to present it all now. Why creativity was profound was it was something happening in the present moment and so the creator was always aware. Think about it. When you 
as a greater being, as the painter, pick up the brush, you have to be aware of the present moment in creating your creation and knowing about it. So collective intelligence made individual intelligence through a present moment of conception beyond and before space and time. So space and time, uh, its origination into thought is the story which we, we, must, we must become aware of such objective reality. You will begin to see after some point the reason Mr. Within is saying observe reality deeply is because it is not that you have to change into something that you are not yet. It's simply you being aware of the changes happening right now and as you are aware of this you begin to see that the mechanisms that interpret fear, stress, depression and all that self-talk begins to dull down. It's as if that moment where for let's say hours you just you just were in the presence of nature, you began to see that that silence knows what it's doing. <laughs> and so man is not taking, is maybe taking the physical existential responsibility of going to work tomorrow, but is not perhaps taking the existential responsibility of seeing what is the nature of this working reality. How does reality work? You know? Before I say we're bodies, how does, how does your vision work? And the nature of vision is the fabulous phenomenon. We cannot be the same. There is never one the same human being. Every human being is a new inspiration. And so our past and future are similarly another dimension of experience. Do you recognize this? Beings who segment their space and time, they give themselves at first a sense of multidimensionality to the elusive idea. But the idea then breaks itself, and if it does, you will begin to see that in one simple moment, you will have nothing to say and nothing to do. You will sit down and be preferenceless. And I was this, I was like this as a child, and then I, something happened later on. And so it's very important because you will see that if you Look at the depths of man's mind. Regardless of what act you do, you question, what is the purpose of me doing this? And you will see, you can never possibly know. Because what you are doing is only accessible through your experiences of understanding. And to be honest, what other people know cannot be real to us unless we are present with them in an experience. So human communication must be made existentially sensitive in the sense that it is kept alive. We need to keep uh, the omniscience in reality alive because that is how we can transcend it. It gets a bit weird when people start talking too much about a truth that's, that's true because we are in the temporal sense of dimension. So eternity can only be an inspiration to an object. It can never be the actual experience unless the object realizes more than a subjective sense, the absolute nature of its presence. And you will see you're untouched, guys. Monsters have faded. Monsters was just a program kept based on comparisons of imagery that came into your view. Do you know? I'm pretty sure everyone can remember bad scenes if they think about it too much. What, why, why do you need to? <laughs> you know? It's like you're going in a park, why do you need to visualize a dumpster? Or why do you need to have any other thought occupy that present moment? Trust me, existential sensitivity, it's simple. It's just self-exploration, it's self-discovery. Finding Mr. Within is just be, being very still and silent and just observing what you are. And you will even see what your fear is, trust me. It's good, because sometimes people have fears. And these fears are, you'd be, you'd be surprised. Sometimes I've noticed I've had a fear at a certain moment, then I realized it's because of a tenseness in my body. So you wouldn't believe, and sometimes it's that tenseness of a body connected to another thought. 
Man more than personality needs to study his presence. Self-help books are talking to the personality. We need to be aware of human communication and I hope you go around people who are living in a sense of observance. Self-observance is the greatest thing. And let me tell you something like this, because I, in an interview on YouTube, I, I heard 50 Cent saying that his grandpa gave him this advice that he shouldn't just be one of those people who's just standing around, you know? And he took that advice and became 50 Cent. <laughs> so his grandpa actually made 50 Cent, but you know. <laughs> but to continue, very playfully here, of course, the inspiration in those words was that you can choose to sit, stand around the block in a reality that is comfortable and doesn't need to change, or you can go change your world. Perhaps what I find very inspirational in 50 Cent's life is out of all those people who were in this condition, he chose to change his reality. Some people just stood in their realities. They're like, oh gosh, I don't want to try that. I'm too this, I'm too that. When you go into a condition where you're, suddenly your mind's like, I'm too this, I'm too that, that is not you. Immediately uh, maintain yourself and stabilize yourself with the silence of your being and recognize that clarity needs no interpretation, that it needs to hurry. If you have to hurry to say an answer, you're missing it. And that's why many, many, I find many people who come to the presence of yogis, for example, let us say Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. These beings, their communication is on a very existential subtlety which the Western mind is so out of focus of. And so all those people who began rec realizing the beauty in transcendental meditation, suddenly it's like their focus of reality shifted. They began saying, oh my God, the grass is green. You know, and so it was very fabulous because they began to notice the actuality of what is here beyond the changes that are happening in the mind. So what I want to say is that it's kind of like we are physically changing and simultaneously throughout the day there's so many projections of reality as I'm in, in changing in what we in quotations call our head, you know, in our head, what's in our head, the neural passage, you know. We begin to see that the neural passage was never built with neurons, it was built with an existential point of awareness in, in, in the sense that there's a formless observance that is you. So you are you in all views and all views were never separate, so segmentation of space and time was a consideration of your conditioning or a choice on look. A choice not looked at enough. It is mankind that is choosing to lose himself when everything in actual reality is suggesting is found. Take existential responsibility Monsters are fabrications based on a comparison of a segmentation of space and time, so you think they are like that. Find your existential certainty beyond thought, and you can. Realize consciousness, even though it's a word that's uh, it's a very important symbol, um, but you can access it more than the symbol. You are more than the limited manifestation, you are the awareness of the instant knowing that manifestation is here. So if you wonder what is keeping existence here, there comes this profound aspect to your vision where you begin to see that, oh, what is here is beyond and before me. So me, my experience is not this because the experiencer is untouched. Trust me, the experiencer is untouched. This aspect of what is meaning for you, there's a way of you looking at it, it's similarly to how there's a way of you right now listening to, this, to these words that is just you. And it is not a you um, with an interpretation, it is not a you that needs to go to therapy to be told that he has an ego, you know? <laughs> we do not need confusion when clarity is a priority. And so the freedom 
of a conscious being was found in his being. You will begin to see that you'd move from just talking about individuality and you will first be, you will experience your collectivity, you will first be in your collective consciousness as you will simply be because you are not suggesting that you are anything. You're simply being, you're observant. And then as you are, you will begin to see that as you bask in the light of your sense of omniscience, you, you see all imagery and all programs fade. All monsters are gone. All ideology, all thoughts, even you being able to know your name is gone. It's not that you don't know it, it's just like your association with form is shifting to one where the, you're, you're, it's like you're becoming less dependent on externality because you're realizing it's originating within. It's like you're realizing, oh my God, it's, the anger came from me, not from them. Do you see? And so you will then begin to see, oh my God, reality did not come from them, it came from me. And so you will go into the mystic's vision and with your grace and intuitive knowing, you will guide yourself into how everything is formed. You will begin to see that you never needed books, but to look at trees. Just go look at a tree, meditate on a tree and you will suddenly come back so much more wise. You know, of course you'd have a lot of tree metaphors in your communication. <laughs> You know, everything would be fruitful for you. you know. <laughs> but it's very important to see the nature of things clearly. And clarity is something which the students of any generation must run into and break all definitions of constantly going to see what's more clear. The problem with humanity is its lack of effort from its individualization because its individuality has lost hope because of a lack of misinterpretation of the true absolute reality. The true absolute nature of reality is you don't know what's going on and so why be limited to the chains? Why be limited to chains of ideology? Why try to be a believer? Why not see that just like how men are, have been conditioned and they have been, you need to really think about it like this. I see that uh, it's very funny because if we take Eastern philosophy and mysticism, we, we are introduced to the concept of reincarnation. And so it simply suggests a pattern of energy constantly being repeated, you know, as if there's a cycle, you know, the cycle of karma. And so when you look at reincarnation and you wonder, God, so many people have fought in unnecessary wars based, you know, fueled by financial greed, you know. And why, it's like, what's going to happen to these beings who are constantly going into these patterns? And so I thought about it, that a being who has been in a war, who has been in a situation of great fight and conflict, his mind and his ideology is aligned and in a sense, attuned to that imagery. So what that means is uh, the fighter might have a guilty conscience, but he is an excellent fighter. So he has some ability in expressing, but not the right act. So simply an engineer, a celestial engineer, would begin to see that man's consciousness, which is being moved by his ideology, will shift into an awareness of self that will take all skills and know that they are emanating from within. And so you are uh, able in any field because your touch and presence is emanating from the intelligence of the moment. Very rarely I say communications that are from me because the moment has everything to say. What all those people forgot in those PowerPoint presentations you were made to do as a kid in, in, your in our school system. <laughs> that when you go there, you are nervous because you have expectation. And this expectation is suggesting, oh, survival for you. Am I going to pass or not? But you see that the most grandest speaker, if you were to really go see, for example, how Martin Luther gave a speech, you know, how the greatest men of our time gave a speech, how Gandhi gave a speech, you begin to see that it was never about the words, that it was the presence of the origination of the communication that was transcendent in its present knowing. When a student learns to be present as a student in front of a guru, then the guru is a blessing to him. Because he is not ignorantly judging based on an ideology that is simply manifesting because social framework was forced into the bill. 
We are not here to make enemies, but to understand that the patterns of thought are dictating the patterns of manifestation in form. So if human beings change their communication by recognizing that their individuality and their collectivity is an unknown journey in which they must go and explore the nature of reality and come to clarity with, certainty does not become something that you seek in an idea. There's no longer a God having your back. There's no longer deities at work, but you recognizing that symbology has its place, but a human being who's choosing to be an advanced communicator is also recognizing that that advanced communication is being received at a very advanced and high state of consciousness which is beyond explanation because it is beyond the dualistic framework. It turns into at most involuntary actions of the human being and utter performance. Just amazing ability, but you're simply aware of it happening now. It's as if you're taking your ideology and you're giving it a freedom of association uh, and so what that means is you're becoming many new forms of your own ability. So one skill in one field is integrating with another because they were all received in the same moment of expression. So when a being commands to himself, when a self begins to communicate and talk to, it, to a greater self, you will see that there was never a distinction in the response. Man is right now very, very, in a very gentle and cool way, I gotta say, kind of transcending uh, psychological frameworks that have been suggesting he's an idea too much because we've had so many human beings have an experience beyond ideology. When you look at this, you need to see that What you fight for, you're choosing to also be. And if you're not aware of what you're fighting for, you will forget the need to even be able. Instead of trying to change uh, yourself, let's say, or your shape or your image constantly, for one moment sit still and go in a walk in a park and perhaps take a very nice notebook just in case you might want to write something. And in that walk, just begin to observe what reality is. You need to realize mysticism is an awareness to a state of consciousness beyond logic. And for many yogis and mystics, it has gone to the realms of existential devotion where you're not worshiping God. Are you crazy? No man has ever worshipped an idea. But man has looked through that idea to see himself. And as he has seen himself clearly, he was never lost between worlds. What that means is if you go into culture and society and you don't like how they are communicating multidimensional frameworks, you have two choices. Either you go sit in a cave like many... <laughs> People in the Himalayas, you know, in other words, go explore your own solitude or you go explore your solitude, but then begin contributing, contributing wisdom. And so you see your creation is suggesting more of your multidimensionality. You don't, you don't realize what a fabulous phenomena the discovery of art was. It was what has kept, what has cultivated and nourished man's multidimensional presence here. Art and anything uh, in that atmosphere. Suggestively, we can be anything, and things can talk about things forever. But practically, each thing can become still. And as we observe simply one state of being, we will immediately learn from other states of being. Do you recognize this? Your vision will be opened instantly. And you will see handling the monsters within was only for you to confront all those blockades to your knowing of an absolute knower. It is, very, it is a very different environment now. Spirituality has become something to talk about. Science is finding itself in a box. Mankind 
is doesn't know if he should be kind or unkind you know survival seems to be a priority that is not letting us uh, live perhaps the way we want at times and you begin to see that human preference has a position and un as long as he has a position in the ideology of his individuation he cannot be the direct experience of that which is the self and so this direct experience will come in you looking at how the quality of how you're looking at things it's simple it's simple stuff it's simple knowing you know it's the, the way i believe it's very good to teach is for example in many Zen traditions they have koans you know what that means is mankind uh, should the content of his education should not just be perhaps just structured in, in, in very it shouldn't just be like this it, it, it should be as if students if they are attending an institution they are receiving the most inspirational stuff and so how can a student receive the most inspirational stuff if the schools are connected and globalization is perfected in the educational system so that different students can have access to one another do you know it's 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 very interesting my background is a uh, Persian and in Iran there has been many revolutions but mainly the one in 79 it was very interesting because it seemed that students were the ones who wanted to change more than anything else students usually in any part of the world get a mind that can begin looking at things in a way where it can it can really be able in its movement and can you visualize all students globalized in an initiative called, for example, One Student Mind. What students, you know? <laughs> and you will begin to see this One Student Mind will not be just students connected. It wouldn't just be school, you know, meetings where students are. It would be the ideas of these students connecting. Because students, at some point, before they go into their individuality, are realizing, okay, I have a choice of either going into the system and getting a better sense of abundance and survival or living individually and seeing where that this path would go Do you see following the intuition of experience and you begin to see that your mind is constantly there where one aspect of you wants to go <laughs> wants to go to a monastery and simply just sit there for a while you know another aspect of you is wondering gosh where can i go and enhance the technology industry for example you know, your mind is going everywhere and you begin to see that life is something in which your observance will be your clarity. Don't think that sometimes you have something when you have not, in a sense, experientially received it. So, there's this very interesting story where there was this kid who was very lazy and was pretty much a couch potato. And so his dad was this uh, blacksmith, something like that. And uh, what happens is the kid doesn't want to get a job, the kid doesn't want to do anything, and the dad's like, go get a job, or go, go, go build a life, or go something. And the uh, kid, you know, he goes and so the mother sees, oh gosh, this kid, the father's being mean to him, so let me, let me just give him. And the money kept giving the kid the money and the kid came home after the, you know, after the, you know, after the day and just came and gave the money the mother gave. And he's like, hey dad, here, here's the money. I made money, dad. I made money, you know. And the, and the dad was not convinced. He's like, this kid is talking shit, Do you know. <laughs> And so what happens is, uh, uh, again, and this happens for a few days until the mother sees that the dad's getting too, too angry and he's like, okay, I can't, I can't give you any money. You know? And so the kid's like baffled, it's like, gosh, you know, what can I do? So the kid goes and pretty much he's kind of in this vibe where he's not g going back until he's done it or something, you know. And so he's going back and so he goes and he begins to see someone is building a house. And so he's like, hey man, uh, I need to make money. Can, you, can I help you? And the guy's like, yeah. You know, so he goes there and, and for a whole day, he goes and builds a house. 
he actually builds the house. He's like, he's like, gosh, I thought I was, you know, this is, he probably felt like <laughs> what child labor felt like, you know? <laughs> and so pretty much this kid, uh, at the end of the day, he's, he looks at it, he's like, wow, I built something here. He looks at the house he's built and he, the guy's like, all right, man, come here tomorrow if you want to continue the job or whatnot. And he gives the kid some money. And the kid has this money and he goes, right? And something I forgot to mention, the father, every time the, the kid would come, the mother would give the kid cash and the kid would come back to the father. The father would take it and he's like, no, this is not yours. And he'd just throw the money into the fire, into the fire, okay? And the kid would just stand there, he's like, all right. <laughs> you know? And you know, the guy, the father would just throw it in the fire and the kid would just stand there. So this day, at, at the end where the kid gets paid and he goes back home, he's going back home and he's tired and he's really tired. It's as if like he's, his tiredness is like a silence. You know, he's just walking home silently. And he goes there and his dad opens the door and he's like, where have you been? And he's like, I've been working all day. And he's like, uh, and then he goes inside, you know. And so he gets the money and he's like, dad, here you go. You know, and his hand's dirty too. And the dad looks at the money and looks at the kid, and I think the dad's smiling, but inside, like outside, he has such a frown. He's like, this is not your money, and he throws the money in the fire. And as soon as he throws the money in the fire, the kid jumps, jumps to catch the money. It's as if like, he's, he knows how much work he put in to get those few coins, so he jumps to catch it, and that's when the father smiles, and he's like, okay. Now, you have worked now you have worked. so simply the reason I'm telling you the story is that sometimes some aspects of our ability are not activated unless experience is gone and there is a certainty which situates us and qualifies us for our greater openings into vision so you need to respect not just your environment but you need to visualize that if you believe in a God for example if you believe in a unified field if you were to go look at every individuality if you were to see that every, if you could be uh, the experience of everything, you would see everything would, for example, worship God or be in the unified field. In an instant, everything was connected in its vision. Just become more certain about your vision and compassionately trust the flow of existence and you will see your life has always been guided. And you know the most beautiful part is? It wasn't you who was being guided. It was the experience, not the object of experience. And there's a profundity there in which the mystic transcendentally smiles about. <laughs> and of course, guys, these need to be done through some important terms. When I was looking at very spiritual topics and stuff, I realized it's useless for you if you're just collecting data. It's useful for you if you begin to see that it should be driven from your sincerity and trust in the forms that are in front of you. So your trust in your vision is actually what is keeping you here. And so develop the sense of trust and you will see all life activate. You will stand in the fire uh, of any condition or circumstance and you will just remain. You will existentially be there. You will have a silence where you realize that your actions are all becoming involuntary uh, in your conscious domain. And the domain is self-conception. The experiencer is free in a way where it could never be changed. So who was changed but a temporal illusion kept by a lack of omniscience? <laughs> lack of observance to the omniscience of man. And then you will see that all monsters have already been fought with your trust in your greatest sense of expression, which is now. On some level, when you speak to other human beings, and of course I'm just sharing some views here, you begin to see that some questions are being asked and are being given answers. Some questions are not being asked and are not being given answers. When you observe this, you see that human communication can only communicate with certainty in its creation of an illusion. 
the only way I can be something which I'm certain as it's here, it has to be my creation because I'm not trusting the creation that I am. When creation thinks it's creation too much, guess what? The creator's never here. <laughs> But when creation observes creation and how creation is here, then the experience of the Creator is found. The inspiration of the touch of the Divine is found. You begin to see that your trust in life is again the flow to all your artistic ability. And trust me, I, a wise man once said, a wise man, a wise yogi I saw on YouTube, he said, there are two ways to live life. You can either trust life or you cannot trust life. And if you, if you don't trust life, you will begin to see that there will be a lot of uh, distance. So when you don't trust life and you begin working throughout your day, you begin to see there's a, there's a distance before you even see if there's a distance or not. It's like uh, you don't want to talk to people even if they could have talked to you. You see? Sometimes introverts are trapped in their own mind games and that needs to be immediately cleared with their attention to what reality is. And it must immediately done, be done. Because after you have clarity, it is then the expression of your clarity. What Mr. Within finds is that human communication needs to be observed not by its quantity, how many times this person has said this, if it's right or wrong, or it should be done by its quality. So you need to sit down. And as you sit down, simply just feel where you are. And where you are is not a place. I'm not telling you to look at an item, I'm just saying be. As you are, you begin to notice very simple things. You see that man can use ideology and be inspired by chaos to bring new orders into place, but always feel as if there's an unknown ruler. Or man can move beyond his spectrum by wondering where his spectrum comes from. So what that means, if, if you know you're a person who's judging people around you and you have good reason, where is the judgment originating from? And don't give me an idea, don't give me an answer. Simply be silent and be. Ask questions and silently await the answers in your own greater self-awareness. Just be present here. The importance of something very important for the mystic is his life is not actually too mystical at all. The mystic is living in utter simplicity because he's looking at the simplicity of the design of his concept. And then understanding would not be a promise, but it would be an inspiration you're always a part of. And so the treasure revealer is revealed the greatest treasure. The observance beyond self. There are no monsters. Observe reality and work well.